Hello, and welcome to the Physical Therapy Owners Club podcast. I am Nathan Shields, I am, and I am excited to bring on Sharif Zeed, the founder and business director of MW Therapy, an EMR company. Sharif, great to have you on, man. Hey, no, I really appreciate it. I'm excited to be here and I can't wait for the conversation. So thank you for having me. Yeah, it's good to have you. I know you guys have been around for a few years and, and I want to share with the, with the listeners your story, how you got into MW Therapy, how long you've been around, all that kind of stuff, and especially how to get in touch with you. But to get into the meat of the discussion, yeah. talk to us a little bit about what do you see? I mean, you're the founder. You see, you know about all the other EMRs. You know about yours in particular, of course. Tell us about some of the trends that you're seeing when it comes to EMR softwares in general. Yeah, it's it's definitely a very, you know, it's interesting. Like you said, I have been doing this for a while, so kind of seeing the the arc of the story a little bit if we were watching a movie. And um, I think what we're what we're kind of just, yeah, to get right into it. I mean, what we're seeing right now is a lot of folks adopted their EMR. You know, it, it seems like now is forever ago, but for most practices, it was somewhere in the 10 to maybe 13, 15 year range from now. And before then, almost everybody was on paper. You know, you think about 2005, six, seven, eight. Yeah. 2008, of course, everybody remembers when the iPhone came out. And so, you know, it's, I really have to change your mindset when you go back to those, to those years. And so because a lot of people have been with their EMR for a while, we're really seeing a lot of interest in the market right now in terms of maybe it's time for something new, especially if, if in that entire time they've been with one thing. And so we're seeing a lot of folks, you know, open to an EMR switch where maybe they weren't before and, and, you know, not maybe always stoked about making a switch, but willing to consider it now. And some, for different reasons, it could be for cost reasons, it could be for features. I mean, there's an infinite number of, of reasons, staff and team happiness, things like that, that mesh in with other things like retention and, you know, challenges around keeping employees. So we're seeing a lot of that. And as a result, I think the EMR space itself is kind of evolving to offer new things. And so that's kind of the, the broad trend that we're seeing out there in the space. It's, it's interesting to think back. I opened my clinic in 2002 and yeah, we were paper-based and eventually we brought on an EMR and then the, the, the new thing was to be cloud-based. What we, if, if we could just have cloud-based EMRs where we didn't focus on having all the storage here on site and, <laughs> and we could have everything on the cloud and have access from our phones. That was the big, big deal. And now that, I mean, you, you just simply have to have that as a software. And that's the gradual trend of most technology, right? So it's nothing new, but it's it's cool to see that um, EMR has come that far, right? It's just expected that we can have all access all the time on any device. But uh, going forward, there are a lot of nuances and, and little tricks and things. I, I, would, I shouldn't say little tricks and things. There's big movements towards other things. Uh, just like it was to get to a cloud-based service. Where where do you think we're headed in some of those regards? Yeah, first of all, I, I couldn't agree more. I mean, I think this is a point of inflection uh, for this sort of stuff now that there's some level of maturity with it um, in the space and and also just practice expectations. Like you said, you know, they've changed. You know, going to the cloud was a big thing. It's not a big thing anymore. It's considered a baseline expectation, sort of like a car should probably have four wheels and a radio in it just to kind of, you know, get started <laughs> to get down the road. And so now, um, you know, it's 2023 now. And, and uh, for my my seat, I'm kind of saying, okay, what's the next 10 years going to look like? And and if, you know, and part of that is to look back at the past 10 and then to look forward. So, I mean, I think there are some really sort of critical areas, right, where, where we're going to see things. So uh, just to rattle off a couple of them, and we could we probably talk about them, but you know, patient facing tech is really big right now um, in terms of, you know, how do patients interact with your practice? If you look back to that 10 years for so your practice, right, you bringing on your EMR involved working with your staff had nothing really to do directly with your patients. Now we're talking about what can patients do with your practice digitally? And that's things like online booking and registration and paying online and a smattering of other. So I think patient facing stuff is big. Obviously, can't get can't have a conversation like this without mentioning AI. You know, it's it's a, become the new buzzword. I, I think five years ago, I was laughing because the big word was big data, and everybody was talking about big data. And do you have big data? I have big data. And are you doing anything with it? And so, you know, these buzzwords come and go, but they definitely can have a lasting you know impact. And and AI is probably one of those ones that there's nobody's going to get out without having some impact from AI and 
EMR and in general, the PT space is no exception to that. So that'll be big. And then the other two are really um, marketing, uh, just grown in tremendous importance, I think, for practices in the last couple of years, you know, increased competition, different regions of the country having different pressures, reimbursement pressures, all those sorts of things driving marketing. And then last one, I would say is just, um, you know, the importance of, of worthwhile, actionable a- a- analytics and data. 10 years ago, again, it was like, just write your notes on the computer. Okay, it's cool. Now I can see it on the computer. Now we're trying to say, okay, how do I take all this data? You know, I've got EMR and documentation, clinical, I have billing data. And so those are kind of four things, I think, when we think about the next 10 years that we are thinking about, that we're hearing about, that we're talking about and kind of focused on. Yeah. In regards to the, so the patient facing technology, the patient portal. Yeah. That sounds really cool that patients can have access to the to the calendar, to their bills, right, with the EMR, and that that would be really nice. Uh, do you see EMR such as yours maybe integrating similar uh, apps? Like uh, like I've had representatives of PT Wired and Weave on the podcast, and even people talking about RTM utilization. Are some of those things, and, and these apps help, engage patients with their home exercise program did they do them or not and and there's an app for the for the clinic where you can go and say oh what was my home exercise program again and they have a portal inside that is that some of the stuff that you're talking about as well besides just calendaring and access yeah those are great examples of patient facing technology right so i mean it's a fancy way of saying you know systems that patients interact with Obviously, usually the clinic interacts with them too to, to put in, you know, fill the bucket with something that's interesting to do. Um, but that's, yeah, those are those are great examples. There's patient engagement and patient facing tech is this big bubble. It's not one thing. Mm-hmm. So you've got different takes on it from different folks, from some of the folks that you mentioned doing different things and some have an HEP focus and some have different focus. From our perspective, you know, as an EMR, our focus is on core functionality that a patient needs to do to interact with, a, you know, things that they would otherwise do over the phone, call to make a, p- a payment, call to schedule an appointment, call to become a new patient, maybe even some things that they might do in person, like check in, um, you know, and, and answer some basic questions about like, hey, is your insurance changed and things like that. We're very into patient portal. We have our own that we've built. Um, that's that's how important we think it, it is and is going to be to the space that um, while we do integrations with all kinds of products, and there's room for many of those in the integra- in the engagement space in general, we think that it's requisite, or if it's not today, it will be very soon for an EMR to have a competent portal where patients can actually do things. <clears throat> and remember, the whole idea is it's a win-win. The practice wins because now you know they're offloading work potentially to the patient, who's happy to take it actually, which yeah. is the other half of the win. And the patients win because while they're buying something on Amazon for eight bucks at midnight, they may also be booking, you know, out towards their plan of care, or they may be paying a bill to you. So you're you're getting some more velocity on the money. So it's really is a rare um, kind of win-win. And you know, again, I mentioned the expectations earlier. Patients' expectations are also sky high now. You know, they're like, why can't I do? anything with your practice online, it's kind of annoying or stop sending me paper statements. I don't want stuff in my mailbox anymore. So it's just like, yeah, I mean, lots of opportunities. And then last thing, so I don't ramble too much, is just RTM is definitely this interesting area, something that we're tuned into as well. And I think it all fits into that same bucket. RTM basically requires patients to engage with the practice digitally. So there's lots of opportunity and, hey, maybe some reimbursements that that come with it, which would be a nice uh, welcome opportunity. Yeah, exactly. And is that something that your your EMR currently has uh, <clears throat> capabilities with regarding RTMs? Because that's kind of a new thing. And yeah. It's yeah. nice if an EMR is, is, a, is capable. Of, you know, right? Yeah, we do have some functionality around RTM. It's definitely an evolving area. Um, you know, it's kind of interesting. Uh, we have uh, some clients that are very into it and, and actually doing a decent bit of it and some that are kicking the tires on it, some that sure. still don't quite know that it exists. Um, I think the big debate I, I'm hearing out there right now is, you know, is is it profitable, I guess, is the question to ask, you know, is is because the reimbursements are great to have new access to a new stream that didn't exist before. However, it obviously has to be weighed against the time of, of the monitoring. Right. That's the last word in it. So that's where I think technology can help too, because if we can help 
you know, automate some of the the monitoring part of it, you know, within the bounds of the regulations and the rules uh, and make it easy to focus on, you know, patients who maybe aren't complying or things like that, then we can bubble up and uh, those people. So yeah, we're, we're very tuned in. We do have functionality around it today. I expect that to be a growing part and sort of fit into all of this same bucket of sort of patient facing stuff. Yeah. One more question before we get off of that. And yeah, last yeah. few years, I haven't seen a lot of the MRs do that, do it up until recently, but do you have the capability and, or do you foresee the capability of keeping credit cards on file? Uh, I think in terms of patient collections, uh, that could be huge, especially if you have a cancellation policy, mm. it's almost inevitable yeah. that you have a credit card on file if you're actually going to charge it. Yeah. It makes it yeah, well, easier it's... on collecting on the back end. I yeah. know there can be some intricacies with HIPAA and, and whatever regulations there might be, but keeping your credit card on file, I think is a huge game changer for a lot of comp- the small businesses that have a hard time collecting the 60 and $80 balances. Yeah. Well, first of all, um, I think right on, right on trend, um, you know, the, I, I always think back again, 10 years ago, the patient portion of the reimbursement was maybe not as big a deal because, you know, patients paid 10% and the insurance paid 90 or whatever. But today, right, as everybody's tried to chase these premium reductions and as a result, higher deductibles, more co-pays, things like that, the patient part is not something you can kind of blink at anymore. Yeah. And in my experience, you know, patient practices are truly, most of them are pretty hesitant to actually send anybody to collections at the end of the day. And, and whether that's a good strategy or not, because you take such a hit on it anyways, is you don't want to get there. So um, yeah, to answer your question, saving card on file is a, it's a nice convenience for the patient because if if you sort of pitch it that way, they'll take it that way as, hey, we'll just get your balances, keep them up to date. And um, in terms of collections, I mean, it's hard to find a faster way to kind of get it going. So yes, we do have cards saved on file. We've had it since I want to say 2019, something like that. So we've had it for a while and we've solved all the HIPAA challenges around that. And so it, it's tremendously beneficial. And um, what we recommend is if clients can integrate that into their uh, paperwork at the beginning, you know, where you have a consent to treat, you also have a consent to charge and you put it up in front and you're like, here you go, give us your card. It's going to be so easy yeah. and everybody likes it. So yeah, yeah, it works really well. That's awesome. What's your yeah. capability? And and I know I'm asking specifics regarding MD. Yeah. Therapy, but no worries. Maybe your experience is similar to a lot of uh, EMR capabilities out there. What's your capability in terms of sending uh, messages direct to text through the EMR? Is that a possibility? It is. Yeah. We actually um, just just rolled this out not too long ago. We call it patient conversation. So we we have that that capability and it's you know in the app on our end. So meaning what the clinicians and the staff use. And then um, the patient obviously has their phone and that actually is, is a part of our patient portal. Um, so cool. we just rolled that out relatively recently and we were able to check off some security boxes too. So it's better than just like emailing. Plus, you know, texting is the new email. <clears throat> As they say, like, you know, you get an email, but you open a text or whatever that saying is. So, uh, and obviously the notification on the phone is kind of hard to beat in front of getting, and it's, it's funny. I mean, in 10 years from now, maybe it will ha- all have to have a chip in our head at that point. But um, yeah, email is email and, and it still has its place. But I mean, we, we've, we've been using texting for a while, obviously for things like reminders. And now we're kind of expanding that and awesome. um, texting patients as much as we can where it makes sense. And, you know, as you, yeah. Great. Talking about AI, yeah, it's kind of yeah. been a thing, right? But I, I don't think it's going anywhere. I think it's here to stay, right? <laughs> AI is going to go staying around. It, it certainly seems that way. I mean, I, I think the stock market certainly seems to agree that if you, if you follow any of that stuff. Yeah, yeah I mean, I, I think it's here to stay. I think like anything else, it, it's still not fully clear what it what it means and f- for whom it means anything. And, you know, I mean, I think obviously this dream is like, you know, chat GPT will write my, my initial evaluation for me in, in two and a half seconds flat by just saying, you know, Nathan is a patient. And then it just goes from there. Uh, how realistic is that? We can only dream. I don't know. Uh, we can dream. Yeah. I mean, I think there's a lot of potential. I also think there's a lot of, you know, probably the biggest challenge specific to, to PT and to healthcare is obviously the security aspect of it. Um, because AI really requires lots of information to be functional and to be useful, but healthcare doesn't lend itself to just sharing everything you know about everybody with with ChatGPT so that 
I do something and then 10 minutes later you have a conversation with it and all of a sudden you have my patient data. We don't want that to happen. Right. So, um, but, uh, you know, that's kind of longer term, shorter term. I mean, it's immediately potentially useful for things like marketing. You know, if, if people aren't thinking about that, they may want to. And, you know, I'll give you a simple example. I mean, can you use chat GPT or whatever your favorite one is barred from Google or whomever to jumpstart a, a, a marketing effort, a, a written article, say a blog for your post, for your website, or maybe it's some other thing you're going to send to your referral base. Can you have it write the first draft? I wouldn't send anything it, it writes uh, without reading it, but I mean, can you get it to jumpstart you? And that has no HIPAA stuff attached to it. And and so I think savvy practices are, you know, at least playing around with it. And, and then maybe way longer term, maybe it actually has some clinical value, like, you know, in terms of diagnosis or treatment. But I think that's that's an even harder problem to solve. So yeah, it's not going anywhere. But is it going to be like 2024? It's going to change everything? Probably not. I think you know there probably needs to be some interim steps, some incremental steps that make right. sense. Well, yeah, I had um, Pedro Teixeira of Prediction Health on a few yeah. episodes, a number of episodes ago, and and the cool way in which they're using it is for compliance purposes, right? That it can assess your documentation and say, hey. This is need might need to be worded this way, or if you are going to do this exercise, then you should build this code, which actually and in and in parentheses, and it actually pays better. Um, that can you know it can it can assess your documentation for compliance purposes. But I know I can't remember off the top of my head, but going back, I should go back and listen to that and and uh, see where he saw some of the AI stuff going. Yeah. No, they're doing some cool stuff over there. I, I know some of the folks over there and and uh, I think they have I think that's a great implementation for for this kind of stuff and and I think in part because you know the insurances are going to be doing this to practices. So in in a sense practices need to do it to insurances. I don't I don't know how else to say that sort of politely, but it's a double-edged sword and it needs to cut both ways um because you know, first of all, again, back to that thing about having a ton of data. Who has a ton of data? Well, guess what? Insurance companies have a ton of data. So they can definitely put that to work for themselves. And obviously, they love to find new and novel ways seemingly every day to how to not pay claims, you know, or how to pay less on a claim. And so this isn't about, you know, PT practices overbilling or anything crazy like that. This is just putting things in a way that maximizes, you know, your payment for legitimately provided services, which is deserved, right? And and you know, I think PTs get beat up a lot, unfortunately, in the reimbursement wars. Um, and there's a lot of sentiment out there about maybe not being valued enough. And I think that's true. I mean, I've watched that happen every year. We get the CMS final rule, and we all go in and try and read 1,800 pages without falling asleep. But you know, it's the same theme. I mean, every every it, look at the past five years, you've had, you know the PTA modifier, try and find a way to pay less here, and then just general reductions. And now, you know, fighting about Medicare Advantage plans and on and on and on. And then of course, United and whatever, they all try and chase each other to pay the least. So yeah, it's it's a battle and both sides have to bring to bear what they have. And um, so I think that's, that's definitely a, a valid and legitimate positive use of the data today. Would you assume that somewhere here in the next year or two, you'll be incorporating some aspects of AI yeah, into for the sure. programs as well. For sure. Yeah. I mean, you know, I, I think again, it's here and it has value. And so we are definitely moving in that direction. Tell me a little bit about some of the marketing tool integrations that yeah. I've always preached the four buckets of marketing, right? You've got reaching out to current patients who are already existing and coming to your practice. We're reaching out to past patients, uh, reaching out to physicians and developing those relationships. And number four, having some kind of social media presence or actually doing things physically in the community at events and fairs and runs and so forth. Right on. Yeah. Yeah. Great. So what kind of tools are you, are you yeah. being integrated? Yeah. In yeah. So quite a few, I mean, we have um, our own marketing um, tool called engage. We call it engage our engage module. And that really hits the first three buckets that you mentioned. So it is an automatic automated emailing and, and messaging tool for um, current patients. Uh, so while they're in their course of care, we actually get also message them before they start their course of care. So once they've become a patient, but they haven't started yet, we have some kind of gap in there. And then post discharge, you know, types of things like check-ins and birthdays and automating around that. So uh, current and past patients, you know, pretty well covered. And, and it's really a lot of set it and forget it. 
you know, where you just, we automate this. So we just say, okay, every year on the patient's birthday, we want to email them a happy birthday and maybe a, a little plug for some wellness service we offer, or maybe a, a free uh, checkup or something like that. You know, that's very popular free screen or something along those lines. And then as far as physicians go, um, we have tools like, you know, fax blasting, which, um, you know, everybody loves to talk about faxing in 2023, but it's still there. It actually doesn't seem to be going anywhere. I think fa- I, my joke is that faxing will will outlast AI somehow. I mean, it, it'd be like 2092 and people will still be faxing. Eh, I don't know how that could possibly be true, but I just feel that it will be. So I'm going with it. But um, yeah, fax blasting is an interesting way to kind of, you know, go through a, a traditional medium, but but actually get in front of somebody's eyeballs, which is what it's all about. And then as far as social goes, yeah, I mean, we we actually have integrations with with products like MailChimp and what have you that can help with the social. So we can like push data over to those systems and, that, and those are good platforms to like do your posting out of and stuff like that. Um, so there's lots of ways to to leverage it to hit those, you know, those four constituencies or three and then uh, through the in-person and stuff like that. And again, it, it's funny to come back full circle, but with a lot of this stuff, a lot of the question is like, what can the person receiving the message do? So if you're if you're marketing to Nathan and you're like, hey, we have a great practice. It's like, great, so now what? So I visited your website, now what can I do? Well, what if you can register online? Now you have a path to actually do something instead because people don't generally just randomly visit websites for fun, right? They, they see something, they're like, hey, that kind of applies to me, let me check it out. But if you don't give them a, a way out other than to make a phone call, we, we know in, in, you know, sort of, intrinsically now from your own experience, picking up the phone is like the last thing anybody wants to do. It just, they don't want to do it. You know, I was, I was like, to use the app on my phone. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's like, they could almost like forget to load that app and like 50% of people wouldn't realize that it was missing for six months. You know, even, even order a pizza, they'd rather order it on an app than call somebody and say, did you say pepperoni? Yes. I said pepperoni. And then you get the order and it's mushrooms. So like nobody wants that anymore. Right. So I think with this marketing stuff, it's, it's coming to, a full circle, like in, in some ways, what has become standardized in the e-commerce space where you have a site and people can buy and there's a cart and there's this, you know, then there are these triggers that if you leave something in your cart, we try and come back to you and entice you to buy it. And every year you get a coupon on your birthday and that makes you feel good. So like these kind of concepts are not necessarily new, but they are new in PT or for right. PT. <laughs> um, so yeah, so lots on the marketing. And I think I mentioned earlier, but a lot of practices are you know, consciously thinking it about and investing in it in a way that I think they weren't uh, even five years ago. I just think and, it's, you know. And it's cool to see what's happening, especially as you make that link back to patient portals, because back in the day, oh, what was it? Um, probably 2012 or 10, where we were trying to make sense of Infusionsoft and how to do all these marketing ca- campaigns through emails and famously had its own nickname of confusion soft because it was really <laughs> difficult to navigate but now you can actually plug and play some of these things and it's nice to see that trend forward that it's not just a reaching out module but it's also linking them back to the patient portal so they can get back into your system and giving yeah. them action items to actually go off of absolutely yeah i totally agree and and um i mean a lot of those tools are very powerful but but at the cost of obviously um you know it takes more to learn the tool and more to use it i mean building out some of those like really complex like journeys as we you know that takes skill and it takes time and so you know we we um we recognize that that's part of one of the things we try and do with engage is because we're specialized right in the pt space we kind of maybe know what the journey should be to some degree so we're able to simplify that a little bit and just deliver to somebody hey you know here's you know here's what needs to be done it's after the fourth visit, it's after discharge, it's, you know, this sort of thing. So, but that doesn't, I mean, look, there are always practices that are on edge of the curve on the front and they may still be using those kinds of tools because they are great and they can do a lot and, you know, really building out even more complex stuff along the way. Well, tell me a little bit about analytics then, um, the yeah. we brought up initially, because I could see personally from, and I'm not knowing MW therapy very well, the downfall of almost all EMRs that I've seen in the PT space is the inability to get appropriate and accurate and easily obtain management reports, productivity reports, or even billing reports. And well, billing reports are a little bit easier usually, but how many skilled units do we bill per visit, per hour? How many patients are we seeing per hour on it? And what's our average visit per plan of care? And 
those kind of things. I mean, it had to, had to be so much manual effort, and if available, a lot of time and energy to find some of those. Yeah. Talk to me about some of the the progressions that are being made in terms of animals. You know, I think the changes that are happening there m- mirror sort of the 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 owners who are running these practices and sort of the level of seriousness they now take with the analytics. So I think some time ago it was very basic, like how many notes did we write, how many visits did we see, and exactly. I, I'm not even sure, honestly, that going back like 10 years that m- it, many people were doing anything with that information. They wanted to know it to maybe intuitively. To, to confirm what they were intuitively feeling, like the practice is doing better, the practice is doing worse, the practice is staying flat, you know, just as three very generic like blocks. Yeah. But today's, you know, sort of sophistication with the owners is much more, like you said, I need to know about like in-depth coding data so that I can teach my therapist how to code correctly or code maximally for the services provided kind of fits in with the early conversation about prediction and all that kind of stuff. So, yeah. so definitely the desire has grown tremendously out there. And then in addition, I think that a lot more uh, owners in a positive way are using the data. So they're not just knowing the data, but if, if the arrival rate is low, if the reimbursement is low, now what, you know, so it's a team meeting, it's a, uh, it's an in-service, it's a change in protocol or procedure, it's a change in systems, it's you know, all kinds of different things you can do to react to these things um, is actually being taken very seriously. So we obviously want to serve that desire. So we have a lot of reports, first of all. Um, we really do take a lot of pride in the ease of them. So I mean, sometimes it is coming to just a singular number. Like what's our percentage of co-pays in the last you know, month or something like that? Sure. It's yeah. our arrival rate. Sometimes it's more complicated. Yeah, We have a great report for like plan of care tracking that a lot of people like that tells you who's over and under and kind of gives you that measure of compliance. Like, you know, people are, we, we said two visits a week for four weeks and they're doing it. And then we, we make it actionable. So if they're under booking relative to the POC, then the front desk can see that and say, okay, I'm going to get in touch with this person and get them to book. And, yeah. you know, that kind of loop can be, can be closed. I will say this because it's just a fun conversation, at least for a minute, for a, a kind of a dork like myself, which is that, you know, reports, the, the thing that people need to know about reports is that any report can have methodology. And so what you're really, if you're really serious about it, what you have to do is understand the methodology of a report, because I, I'll just give a very simple question. How many visits did you do last month? And then the immediate question is, well, do we want to include cancels and no-shows? Do we want to exclude certain patients because we don't really count those as visits, even though technically they're on the calendar as a visit, but it's a free screen, so we don't want to count that. And I can go on for probably 20 minutes. So what really I think the practices that are successful with this are doing is they understand what the report is made to do because that can differ. You know, I mean, some some can just give you the shotgun approach, like, okay, we just count every visit, canceled or not, every color, all the time. Others will give more granular filters. Like we, we do have the facility to build reports for people if they need it, you know, because so, every practice has a different. And a lot of times too, what we're seeing is like, there may be different aspects of the business. Like there's a wellness aspect to the business that's cash. And we want to think about that differently than we do other pieces. So we really do try and honor all of those things and use what we think are very common sense, you know, kind of assumptions, if you will, or designs. And then try and make that transparent so that the person can understand what it is and not do something because they think they're interpreting the data in some way. So it's a very interesting, and I, I always tie this back to clinical, you know, everybody does their poster presentations, they're beautiful, right? But a lot of the, the time is dedicated to explaining like the parameters of the study or the assumptions that were made. So it's the same thing, you know, and there's no simple answer. Like another one, what's, what's your average reimbursement per visit? Well, which visits, you know, and do we want to include all insurances or do we know that XYZ is an outlier and they screw up the average? So we want to take them out of the pool before we do that. So we don't end up with like a skewed number that is, is really messing us up. So anyways, it's uh, it's really a great, it's really intriguing. I think that data again has tons of value and and practices should should value it. I don't think they should overvalue it, but I think they should value it and to make change, to make actions that actually are going to improve the metric, maintain the metric if you're happy with it, or increase it if, if it's not quite where you want it to be. You know, it's um, I've always looked at our industry, the physical therapy industry specifically, as being like 10 to 20 years behind technology-wise. <laughs> and I'm wondering, you're in that space, and um, 
are there things that you wish the industry had or was implementing from a technology standpoint that it's not or just not capable to take on at this time that the rest of the world is uh, integrating now? Is there anything like that? Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, I think that generally people think of healthcare in general to some degree that way, like, you know, because because of, I think a lot of it because of security hurdles are, are some of the challenges that really most clients don't think about anymore because we've we've really, as our company and our industry and the EMR space has taken on a lot of those pieces and we just try and present it as like, here's a login screen, <laughs> just go. Yeah. Uh, it's never that simple. Um, so, I mean, you know, I, I don't know if I'd say like, you know, I don't think the PT space is any any sort of worse than any of the rest of healthcare. Every, everybody's got a story about their physician, their dentist or whatever. For whatever reason, dentists are very good at being on the forefront of some of this stuff. And I, I was thinking to myself, why is that true? And I think part of it is their visit cadence is so different. If they don't remind you like 60 times, you don't show up for the cleaning six months later. So they've been uh, by necessity um, have 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 kind of done it. So. My only, my only thought would be, you know, there's a lot of stuff. It, it, I don't know if there's an old anecdote about Microsoft Word, which I'm sure you, everybody knows. And they did some study and they said, you know, most people are unaware of 80% of the features in, in the thing, you know, and they just like, it can do all this stuff and nobody does it or, no, or even knows about it. And so a lot of times when it went with an EMR or any system, EMR is a good one because it's sort of a backbone. It's like all about implementation. So if your staff are not on the same page or if your processes are very ad hoc, meaning like nobody sat down and thought about how to intake a patient and you just sort of, well, Nathan's at the front desk. I don't know. He does it on the phone. The patients get in there. I have no idea. You know, it's not bad in the sense that your patients are getting in there. But if we maybe spent, you know, an hour thinking about it, maybe we could have a better patient experience. Maybe we could have less work for Nathan. Maybe we wouldn't need two front desk people. Maybe we would only need one. And we're struggling to hire that second one right now because there's nobody out there to hire. But turns out with some process improvements and meshing that with the tech, we don't. So I, I think that's my my only thought is you can't just think about software as, as just, you know, you open the box and it makes your practice better. It's really about, and I see this all the time with owners that I talk to, the ones that really are intent, like consciously thinking about process and how it fits in with the humans, with the tech have the best, seem to have the best handle on things, seem to have the work, the best time in situations where somebody leaves, you know, cause that can often be like a huge problem. Oh, Nathan's been here for 20 years. He just left. We don't know what to do, but the practices that are intense, intensely focused on that seem to, to bounce back or, or not even have any detriment from that kind of stage. Bring somebody in new, here's how we do it. it this is our process. And it, it sort of works out. Yeah. And that totally resonates with me that we're even though we might not be aware of the capabilities of a lot of our EMRs because we don't spend the time in it. We just use it to meet the bare minimums to get the things done that we need, we know need to get done where if we just knew a little bit more and maybe optimized what we had in front of us, there could be better, like you said, processes, procedures, less manpower necessary, or even time and energy necessary if we really just optimized what was in front of us. Totally agree. And I think this this is probably a conversation for another day. But I mean, this is what the whole thing about, you know, owners like working on the business versus in the business kind of thing that we, we often hear. But I think, you know, getting out of the sort of day to day, if you can, at least a little bit of time, that's when you have the mind space to think about how how it's going, you know, and, and like how these processes are working, as opposed to just putting out fires all the time. And I think um, I know that's something you focus on and talk about uh, often and in and, and, and the kind of coaching role and that sort of stuff. So I think that's, you know, it's like now you have this time, you know, here's what you could do with it. If, if you want to put it, put it into the business, this is a way that you can productively do so. And it can make a big difference. And in fact, it could maybe even deliver you more time, which is where the, con you know, where you're starting with it. So maybe you do sit down and watch all the training videos regarding the EM. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what, do they, yeah. what do they say? Like, yeah. Like ninety percent of people never watch all the videos. And oh yeah, complain about can, what the system doesn't have after the fact. I can totally confirm that. I, I think it might be ninety nine, but whatever it is, it's it's a high percentage, and you know. But so that's our that's our challenge to make it intuitive enough that people can can just go in and do it. Uh, yeah. I still think yeah, you can get a lot more if maybe you put a little bit of that time. But yeah, it's it's a yeah. funny one and yeah. definitely true, <laughs> definitely true. Well, how did how did you get into this space after all? Yeah, are, are yeah. not a physical therapist, right, Sharif? And 
Uh, and so how did you decide to get into the physical therapy space of all spaces to pr- develop the software? Yeah, it's a great question. Uh, yeah, I um, I started, uh, been in the tech space uh, basically my entire career. I'm kind of a finance um, person by sort of education pedigree. So, but I've always been on the line between finance and, and tech and uh, always love tech. And I uh, had a different startup years ago that was uh, fitness focused. Um, and um, through that, um, that project and that app started meeting PTs, like just because, you know, you see them, they're, they're, they're doing exercise clinically and um, they really liked what we were, what we had at that time. This, this is going back more than 10 years now, but of course there's so much more to, to, to everything than just exercise tracking. And that's how I, I ultimately got in was we sort of said, okay, well, we have this great exercise tracking platform. And I'm, I'm thinking about, right, I'm wearing a Garmin. Many people do. Fitbits didn't exist. All those things were, were, were not a real thing. So it, was, it, was, it, wasn't, it was a novel space at the time. And um, so anyways, having met some different PTs and then put together like an advisory group of PTs, you know, built out the EMR got it out the door and then basically have been steadily adding to the product since. Um, and it's been a very exciting ride. Got to meet and work with a lot of great people over the years and still get to do that today, which is pretty cool. And so, um, yeah, I've, I've kind of steeped in it at this point. I, I, I know that I know practices pretty well and I'm fortunate to, to work with some good folks on my team here too, that, uh, that are learning the same. And it's been around for how long, how long has MW Thimper been? Yeah, we've been around for a little bit over 10 years. We've been around for a while. Um, we we sort of pioneered built-in billing back then, um, which which now is kind of is considered cool, which is interesting. What's old is new again for us. Um, when we're looking to do the same things now and and kind of continue to be a vanguard uh, for for the space and but also you know fit the business side well to keep the pricing reasonable. We know that the reimbursements aren't where everybody wants them to be, and and we need to be respectful of that. And and then just to provide really really good service um, to back our product up and you know. Um, help everybody and, and do what we can to elevate PT itself as a, as you know, that's important to us because we believe in it. And, um, you know, that's something that we try and do our part sort of in the space to ensure that those messages get out. Yeah. Well, I know Will Humphreys over at In the Black Therapy and my business partner hold you guys in high regard and, and loves your product and what you're developing now and how quick you are to make some changes in the system that, that make it even better. But um, if people wanted to get a hold of you or learn more about the MR House, yeah, how would they do that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, big, big fan of Will's too, as 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 I am a fan of yours as well, for sure, and appreciate that. So mwtherapy.com is the easiest place to start. I want to encourage everybody to find me on LinkedIn if that's your jam and uh, connect with me there. And um, we'd love to have a conversation with you anywhere that it works, uh, any channel that you like, if you're on Twitter, you can find us there at MW Therapy. So we're, we're kind of like you might expect sort of everywhere. But uh, if you're interested in learning more about the product, mwtherapy.com. If you want to just connect with me, LinkedIn is great. And I welcome welcome that and always enjoy meeting and talking with anybody and everybody. So it's an open door. Well, I've got to ask, what does M yeah. stand for? Yeah, you know, you're not the first to ask. It stands for Merlin, like the magician, and then Wave, which is actually the name of the company. And there's not really a great story that I could share. I've always thought I should come up with a cool story that I could, it's like when you get like a, you know, a huge injury and you want to have a cool story about how you got it, but turns out you just stub your toe on, uh, you know, on a piece of furniture. So um, yeah, that's what MW therapy is. And we are, and have been, we're all in on rehab. So all of our clients are, you know, basically PTs and then OTs and speech providers, but PT is definitely the the bulk of our, of our effort and, and space. Gotcha. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thanks for sharing today, man. I really yeah. appreciate it. It was great talking with you. Yeah, it was great talking with you too. I hope everybody enjoyed and uh, hope to have an opportunity to come back on in the future. We can talk about the weather or anything else EMR related, whatever goes, and uh, we'll see you next time. Thanks, right. Nathan. Thank you. Yeah, see you later.